Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders and back for another educational lecture. First and foremost, I wanna apologize. It's been a little bit since I put one of these out, maybe a couple weeks now. Uh, it's been a very busy summer for me. However, uh, I have a pretty good lecture for you guys today um, on volume and understanding candlesticks within the context of the chart, okay? A lot of people like to trade in a vacuum. Uh, and when you look at an individual bar, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So this video is gonna talk about three different topics. It's gonna talk about understanding candlesticks sticks within the context of a chart bottoming tails, topping tails, et cetera, and so forth. It's also going to talk about volume. Volume is one of the single most important things that you guys need to understand to become a great trader, okay? You have price and volume there, the only two things you need. I am not a fan of indicators. I know there's a lot of people that like their MACD crossovers and their stochastics and their comm channel uh, indexes and all the other stuff, Fibonacci retracements. I am not into any of that stuff, okay? And then, Lastly in the video, which is actually the first part of the video, it's gonna talk a little bit about why traders fail. One of the reasons or several of the reasons why traders struggle so much to get good at this business. Uh, it's about an hour, just over an hour long. You wanna sit through the whole thing. It starts off a little bit slow, guys, but overall, it's a very good video. And the other thing you wanna keep in mind too out there, guys, is there is so much marketing out there on Google, on Facebook, on YouTube, everywhere you look, on Twitter, on Stock Twitter, and everybody's telling you how you can get so rich so quick as a trader. You can wake up you know, in your pajamas and make a gazillion dollars. You can turn $348 into a million dollars in 67 days. Guys, it's all garbage. It's all hoopla, okay? Anybody that's selling that is selling you an unrealistic dream, okay? I'm here to tell you, and I say it in the lecture today, this is a very, very, very challenging business. In fact, it will likely be the single most challenging thing you ever try in your life, okay? That's true for probably 99% of you. This business, trading, will be one of the most challenging things you have ever tried. It will also be one of the most rewarding businesses you ever try if you stick with it, if you give it the proper time it takes and needs to get good. Guys, you're not doing this in 30 or 60 or 90 days. You're not doing this with $500 in your account, okay? I don't care what anybody says to you out there. They're lying to you if they say otherwise. I've been doing this a very long time, and I used to work on Wall Street as a buy-side institutional trader. I've been very successful in life, and I'm just telling you the truth. If you wanna be a great trader, you're gonna have to give it one to three years. You're gonna have some ups and downs. You're gonna need an education. You're going to need market experience, okay? You're going to need patience. You're going to need discipline. You're going to need humility. You're gonna need all of those things to be good in this business. And you can't do it with $100 or $500, guys. You need at least two to 5,000 bucks to get, to have a decent chance at this business, okay? I'm just trying to be straight with you, just trying to be honest with you because I've seen so much internet marketing nowadays and it's all flash. And don't get me wrong, I'm guilty of some of those things from time to time, but I'm telling you straight, it's a one wonderful business, okay? And everybody should learn at least a little bit about the stock market for their future portfolio, even if you don't wanna be an intraday trader for core trading, swing trading, wealth building, your 401k, your IRA, all of those things, you should learn about the stock market because between the market and real estate, they're the two biggest creators of wealth in this world, okay? So anyway, stick around for the lecture, guys. As always, okay, if you would like to check out my live trading stock room, the chat room, it's $1, $1 for 30 days, guys. It's a trial membership, $1 for 30 days. You can email info at live traders dot com to get more information on that all right so enjoy the video guys it's about volume it's about why traders struggle so much and also candlesticks in the context of the bigger chart jared wesley let's get to it today's lecture guys is going to be on candlesticks and volume but also more than that, the first few slides are just gonna be talking a little bit about a daily routine for traders. So the first two or three slides will not have really anything to do with candlesticks and volume. Um, but as we get into it, there are a lot of charts that we're gonna take a look at because in my opinion, the two most important things in trading are 
price and volume, right? Candlesticks represent price and obviously the volume is the volume. Without those two things, you can't have trading. Trading does not exist and they go hand in hand, right? You can't have price without somebody willing to pay that price, which equals volume. And we'll talk about the importance of volume. Volume uh, is probably, you know, we used to say that price is number one and volume is number two. Uh, I'm going to say that they're both equal, right? You have to have both to be a successful trader uh, and volume uh, where it happens, how it happens is extremely important. I don't think you guys quite fully appreciate or understand just how important volume is. And there's three different types of volume that we will be talking about. Um, for those of you that haven't already done so, uh, you can check us or me out on social media. Um, obviously, you can check us out on YouTube. I don't really post much on, um, on what we call it, Instagram anymore. Uh, I'm a Scoutmaster one, but I haven't posted in several months and I don't plan on posting much in the future. I find it annoying. Um, but anyway, let's dig in, guys. So here's a few reasons why a lot of traders struggle. Okay, I thought I'd throw this in because um, here the last couple few days, the market's been a little bit challenging. I've seen some frustration with traders. And uh, what happens when you get frustrated as a trader is it, it becomes a snowball uh, and it tends to get worse. And you're not looking at the bigger picture. All right. This business is not measured on one day or even a week or a month or even really a year. Honestly, uh, you look at this in some respects as a sales type of a job uh, and no salesman, no matter how great they are, has 12 perfect months a year. You know, you're never number one for all 12 months. It's extremely rare to do that. So you're going to have ebbs and flows in trading. All right. But the main reason that most traders fail, in my opinion, is they just don't understand what this business is. They have no idea what is expected of them or from them, all right? The reason that is, in my opinion, is internet marketing, right? You take a look at Twitter, you take a look at Google, stocks, it's whatever. Uh, there's a lot of good information out there on trading, but there's also a lot of fluff out there. Everybody wants you to think that you can be a great trader in 60 days or 90 days or six months even. Um, trading at a high level takes many, many years. So I'm not going to spend a long time on this topic, but I just wanted to go over the bullet points of why I believe a lot of traders fail. And then we'll go over the candlestick charts uh, and then we'll also go over the volume. Okay. Education and guidance. All right. Uh, it gives you a much better understanding of, of how to make money, right? When somebody is willing to guide you through the process of what's expected of you and from you, it's easier for you to not only appreciate what's expected, but to deal with what's coming up. Why do, why do people have apprenticeships when they want to become a plumber or an electrician? Why do doctors go to college? Why does everybody go to college these days? For the education, but for the guidance, really, right? Um, that will help you get a better job. So um, whether it's a trading friend, whether it's live traders, whether it's somewhere else, get yourself an education at some point. The other thing I see with a lot of traders is they either don't have a trading plan or the plan they have is way too broad. It's not specific enough. So I use the term very um, specifically, well-defined trading plan. It's your roadmap to success, okay? You have no idea where you're going to go without a map, right? And sure, you can stop at a gas station and say, hey, where's this? People don't do that anymore because they have GPS, but you get the point. In the old days, you used to have a map, and if you didn't have a map, you'd stop it in a gas station where locals um, know how to get somewhere. Well, the problem is, is that you forget oftentimes, right? They go, oh, it's three lefts, two rights, and, and then go straight. And you're all of a sudden halfway through, you're like, what was, what was it he said? So you have to have a well-defined plan. And I'm a big believer in the weakest ink is stronger than the best memory. The weakest ink is stronger than the best memory. So if you don't put it on paper, it's not going to happen. So your plan has to have tools, what charting software you're going to use, the, the internet that you're going to use, your tracking spreadsheet, defined goals, what type of patterns you're going to trade, when you're going to trade, how much risk you're going to use, what account size you're going to have, when you're going to raise risk, and how you're going to raise risk, how you're going to lower risk. All of those things are extremely, extremely important. Uh, I'm not going to go over those things today because they're all in professional trading strategy. There's an entire chapter. And on top of that, there's Trading Plan Essentials, which is a 65-page book on exactly how to build a trading plan. Now, next, and this one, this one is one you would not expect, um, but you need objectivity and humility. Objectivity, most people think they have, but they don't have. Right? I find this to be very true in general in life. Most people have a higher expectation, not a higher expectation, a higher opinion of themselves than is what is actually true. 
right? Most people walk around with an elevated perception of themselves, okay? Does that make sense? So in trading, you need to check yourself. And that's where humility and objectivity comes in because the market is always right, guys, okay? You need to learn from your mistakes and never stop trying to improve, all right? You're gonna go through some tough patches and you're gonna question yourself. But the one thing you don't ever wanna do is lose control Think you're better than the market. This often happens with people on a winning streak. They think they're better than the market and then they get bitten or they think I don't need a stop loss. You know, this, this always comes back. Every trade always comes back. So that objectivity is the reason it's so challenging in trading is because you don't have a boss. You don't have somebody to tell you when you do something wrong. Even though there are times you know you've done something wrong, you'll make an excuse for it. A boss is going to give it to you straight. And that's one of the reasons trading is so challenging. And then, of course, experience, guys. Most traders I see, their expectations exceed their experience. They come in and they have expectations of a 10-year trader and they want to do it in six months. They somehow think they're different. So they don't have a realistic timeline. They're very greedy and they're very, very naive about what this business is really about, how challenging this business really is. Because this business, in my opinion is the single most challenging thing that 99% of you have ever done in your entire life. Yes, I will repeat that sentence. This business, trading, is probably the most challenging business that 99% of you have ever tried. You think you've done some tough things in life, you haven't done this, okay? There might be some of you that have gone off to war or you drive a tank for a living. Maybe that's different because the consequence is greater. But in terms of day-to-day -day fluctuation, frustration, uh, excitement, the myriad of emotions you go through and just a sheer challenge. Trading is, is very, 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 very difficult, okay? So you have to work hard toward your defined goals with humility, objectivity, and patience. Without any one of those things, you're gonna have a hard time, okay? You're gonna have a hard time. You fail, guys, because you just don't understand what's expected. You don't understand the fees and the cost that are involved in this business. I see a lot of traders, for example, starting out using $5 flat fees, but you're trading 100 share lots. Why are you paying $5 for 100 shares? That's insane, right? It's insane, okay? So you have to understand, and this is where education comes in, or a lot of you come in, you're undercapitalized, and this is also in connection with your goals exceed your expectation, right? Your expectations exceed your experience. Okay, does that make sense? So what I'm saying is you come in and you're like, yeah, I'd like to make 100 grand this year. Well, how big is your account? Oh, I have $2,000. Oh, and you're a brand new trader and you're paying $5 a trade fee because you don't realize you can pay less than that. Okay, all of these things putting together and then you throw the icing on the cake. So you don't understand what's expected of you. You're using a fee structure that's not right for new traders, okay? Maybe you have an unreliable platform. I see people trading on Robinhood or Meditra. All the, come on, guys. Get professional tools, period. Go get yourself a TradeStation account. Get yourself a Fidelity account. Get yourself an interactive broker account. Get yourself a Thinkorswim account, whatever. But stop. Everybody thinks free, 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 free. It goes to show you you're broke. If you're looking for a free trading platform, that's the only, that's your number one concern is the cost of the platform. You're misguided and you're broke. Tell me I'm wrong. If that's your number one concern, you're broke. Okay, and that means you're not ready for this business. If you think Robinhood is the shizzle because it's free, I have news for you. It's not that good, all right? You're paying more on the spreads and you're ultimately paying way more than somebody who's paying 50, 100, 150 a month for a platform, okay? And nowadays, most of the platforms are essentially free if you trade enough. So you combine all of these things with the killer, a lack of discipline and no safety switch, no poor money management. You don't follow the rules. You don't know when to shut it down and take a break. Okay, I see it from experienced traders from time to time. People that are coming in, they want to trade BYND, they want to trade Amazon, they want to trade all the spready whippy stocks because wait, they want to get rich quick. And then they trade them with a thousand shares. And all of a sudden, one day they decide not to take their stop loss, you know, because they know it's going to come back up and it doesn't. It drops 40 more dollars and they're down. Oh, wait, they're not down. They blew up their account. Okay, so once you start throwing all of these things in, trading becomes very challenging. Because at the end of the day, most people lack this, the discipline. And having no boss makes it so much tougher to have discipline. You see, with a boss or something or you know, a police officer walking across the street, there's always consequence. In the back of your mind, you're like, if I don't look both ways when I cross the street, I might get hit by a car, I might die, I better look both ways, right? 
If you show up late to work too many days in a row, you in the back of your mind, you're thinking, my boss is going to kill me. No, they won't. They'll just fire me and they fire me. I lose my income and I lose my income. I lose my house. I lose my car. I lose my food. I lose everything. Consequence keeps you from showing up late. What is your consequence in trading? Losing money. But guess what? There's nobody there to keep you from yourself. I'll repeat that. There's nobody there to keep you from yourself. Yes. When, what do they say? When the, when the cat's away, the mice will play? Well, what happens when there's no cat? You're just going to do whatever the heck you want because there's no consequence for you not to. So the reason I'm commenting so, so many times in a row on this particular topic is because because there is no boss, because you don't have consequence, it takes people longer to realize the problem or to fix the problem. Because the second you do something wrong in a, in a corporate environment, right? They have a system of rules. And when you do something wrong, there's a system that tells you what will happen to you, right? Cause and effect, cause and effect. So I show up late once, the boss says, hey, what happened? You get a warning, you show up late twice, maybe you get docked on your pay or a suspension. You show up late the third time, you get fired. Cause and effect. What is the cause and effect in trading? Well, if you don't follow your rules and don't take your stop, you will lose money. But so what? What's going to stop you from doing it again? The, usually what happens is you blow up your account so badly or blow the entire thing up that you have, you're forced to quit. So that safety switch is very important. You throw that in with not enough capital. You throw that in with high trade fees and a terrible trading platform. It all comes back to you just didn't understand what was expected of you because you were too cheap right? Just calling it the way it is. You were too cheap to go get some guidance and education because you know what? You knew better and you were going to read that free article on Google. Great. Good for you. So you didn't form a well-defined plan. You don't have objectivity. You clearly lack experience and you still have all these things. You're still greedy and naive. You don't have a realistic timeline because, well, nobody taught you what a realistic timeline was and your expectations are still grossly exceeding your experience because... You didn't get guidance because you don't know what a real realistic expectation is because you ultimately had a lack of understanding. It's like a big circle jerk, isn't it? Okay. So in trading to be successful, guys, you're going to follow this planning cycle. You're going to plan. It's going to be a crappy plan when you first make it. You're going to try to implement that plan. I said try because that's usually what it comes down to. Then you're going to measure the results. Then you're going to make an assessment and then you're going to make adjustments to improve it. You're going to go through this over and over and over. it's like a continuous cycle that never, ever ends. All right. Plan, try to implement. And that's key because a lot of times after you measure, you'll realize you didn't actually implement your plan. Right. Unwell is doing two RL or nothing right now. He's doing a great job of it. But a lot of traders try to implement two RL or nothing. Once they go back to measure it, they realize, wow, I did not really do a very good job of imp implementing this plan. So I need to assess Right? I need to assess what happened. So the measurement is just empirical data. The assessment is like, what, why can't I follow my plan? What is the problem? And then you're going to make an adjustment and improvement over and over and over and over again. This, this wheel will never stop turning. Okay, so that's my little lecture, guys, in terms of why people struggle so much in this business, why they fail. And most of it's because the information they're seeing online is garbage, garbage. Okay, I turned $248 into a million dollars in 18 months, but I still live in my parents' basement and drive a shitty car. Hmm, right? But that's the stuff you're talking about. And you see people trading these penny stocks where they go from 50 cents to $5 in one day, and they're risking their entire account on it. Guys, you chip away at this business like any business. You don't get rich quick because that's not the type of business is, this is. All right? Okay, now for the stuff you guys came for. After this, all right? Define trading plan, develop a market bias, check relevant news reports, create a focus list, prioritize your list, put those on thumbnails, be patient and wait for your pitch. All right. I'm not going to go over this individually. I'll be here another 20 minutes. Okay. Follow that routine and you'll be fine. All right. Let's talk guys a little bit about context. You know, what does this guy mean? Context. Everything we do in trading and generally in life is based upon some level of context, okay? If you took one sentence out of a one-page dialogue, 
you might have a completely different opinion than what the dialogue suggests you should have, right? Who does this a lot? The news media does this all the time, all the time. They take a snippet from a politician or an actor or actress, literally one sentence snippet, okay? Or maybe six seconds of somebody's two hour speech, wink, wink, hint, hint, okay? And then all of the sudden that becomes the topic of everything. That seven seconds that they recorded is the topic of the entire two hour speech. It is not. That one sentence you read in a newspaper becomes the topic of the entire paper. That one sentence comment an actor or actress makes becomes all you talk about. But that is, has nothing to do with what they were really talking about. Trading is the same. Looking at one bar by itself is meaningless. It's utterly meaningless. Truly meaningless, guys. I don't care what the bar is. Doesn't matter. It's meaningless. Unless you look at the bar within the general context of the larger chart. Okay, now this chart could be a one minute chart. It could be a monthly chart. It could be a five. It doesn't matter. All right. So I want you guys to understand that by singling out this wide range red bar by itself, it doesn't mean anything. By singling out this doji bar by itself, it doesn't mean anything. But once you start looking at these bars in the formation or the context of how they form and where they form, right? So how they form, which means how the individual bar formed and where it's forming on the chart are the two things you want to continually ask yourself. So stock moves up, puts in a red bar, red bar, red bar, red bar. So now you're down four red bars in a row. Now, let me ask you a question. The next bar has a bottoming tail right here. Okay. So four red bars in a row on a pullback, and then there becomes a bottoming tail with a little doji top. Bottoming tails typically represent buyers, right? At one point in time, this was a wide range red bar, right? This bar right here looked like this bar over here. That's a factual statement. This bar here with the bottoming tail at one point in time looked exactly like this red bar over here, okay? Exactly like it. But when it got to the bottom, it started moving back up. Buyers started buying the stock back up. So when you look at this, guys, this bar closed at the low. The next bar closed at the low. The next bar closed at the low. And the next bar closed at the low. This is the first bar in four bars, three of which are wide range, that did not close at the low. So the immediate thought process here is, for the first time in four bars, the stock did not close at the low of the bar. So the context there is buyers are starting to step up, perhaps, because we don't know yet, perhaps the trend on the stock is beginning to change. But it's still so early in the move, we don't know if this is just going to be a little peekaboo bounce, a little shallow retracement because I don't have the other context over here. But what I want you guys to take a look at is this bottoming tail right here compared to this bottoming tail all the way on the right hand side of the chart. They're almost identical in size. One is red and one is, is green, but they're both bottoming tails. They both suggest that buyers stepped up, right? Stock was at the bottom and then buyer stepped up. Stock was at the bottom, buyer stepped up. But what's the difference? Because there is a big significant difference here. The difference is where it is happening on the chart. So if you looked at both of these bars in a vacuum, literally you put them side by side in a vacuum, you would sit there and go, well, there's not a lot between these bars. Yes, one is red and one is green, but ultimately they're very, very similar bars, bottoming tail bars. You go to yourself, well, they're the same but they're not. So right here, the context is four green bars with a, a little red bar and then a bottoming tail, but you're still at some pivot resistance. So yes, this is still bullish, but I'm actually believing the stock will go higher down here more so than up here because the stock is already extended over here and there's resistance to the left. 
So even though they're the same bar, where they're happening has a tremendous impact on my opinion of what's going to happen next. Okay, and don't get me wrong, we're gonna see some more examples of this later. I'm gonna come back and we're gonna to touch upon this. Okay, I'm gonna to touch upon this later. Okay, so here, this bottoming tail bar, now you're really bullish because now you have a double bottom retest. So you have a stock that's extended, right? One, two, three, four bars down with a bottoming tail bounces. So this might just be a sell setup. We don't know, right? It might just be in a downtrend sell setup and the stock might just keep going lower, 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 lower. But that's not what happened, right? That's not what happened. The bottoming tail is at the same area, give or take, as the previous bottoming tail. So the last time the stock traded in this area, it bounced. So if you leave a big old bottoming tail in the same area the stock previously bounced, there's an even higher likelihood it's gonna break and go higher, right? Guys, what is technical analysis, okay? Technical analysis is simply the art of using past price action to help predict future price movement. That's all it is. So past price action suggests buyers stepped up here. Well, same here, right? This, we're looking back, looking to the left, always look to the left, and you go, wow, buyers stepped up there before. Now they're starting to step up again. This is a possible double bottom retest and failure, trend changing buy setup. You might have, we don't have enough information, you might have gone from a stage four downtrend to a double bottom retest and failure that goes higher. This might literally be the bottom and it might be the world's best buy setup. Wow. Then over here, you get a wide range red bar that gets completely engulfed. That is reconfirming the strength. So you have another opportunity to buy. Why? Because if you drew a line right across this, you're right at the resistance point. There's a pivot resistance area, a little pivot resistance area, and you are taking that all out. You're not just taking out two pivots. You're taking out two pivots after a bottoming tail retest and engulfing a wide range red bar. This is super powerful. I mean, this is a money setup right here, okay? No, it's not a three bar play, guys. Not all trades are three bar plays. Imagine that, right? You'd buy at the high, put your stop at the low. Ride it to the prior pivot high. Guys, I could sit here for literally, I'm not kidding you, another hour and talk about every chart on this. But the key here is understanding that candlestick bars are only meaningful in the overall context of the chart. Okay. Now, I put this next slide in because I want you guys to understand. A lot of people ask, I get this question frequently. How do we know this is going to work next year, the year after, the year after? Right? How do we know candlesticks aren't dying? I've been getting asked this question for 15 years. This is how you know. Okay, Guys, this is a yearly chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1900 to 2015. Yes, it's four years old. Okay, That's 120 years or 115 years. 115 years. Do you see anything different? from 50 years ago to 100 years ago to now in terms of the patterns. There's buy setups on here. There's breakouts on here. There's climactic setups on here. There's double bottom retests that we just talked about and climactic buy setups. This stuff has been going on for 115 years. Guys, you could chart anything, anything. You could chart the sale of pet rocks and you'll get a graph, won't you? right? You'll get a graph. So the point I'm making for all those people out there, because I get the comment occasionally that think that this is magically going to end, the value of technical charts is going to end, check yourself. What's been going on for 115 years won't stop. And the main reason it won't stop is why? Human being. It's called human nature. We are geared or mentally programmed, if you will, to think in terms of fear and greed. The need to be right fear, greed, these things will never stop, right? If the market drops 28% next year, there will be tons of fearful people out there and fear begets fear and people will sell and they compile it and make it worse. And this is what happened in 2008. That's how you get a climactic setup when too many people are fearful and not enough buyers, 
right? The sellers outweigh the buyers. And then you get to a point where enough people, not everyone, but enough people think, wow, what a great value. What a great value. I'm going to start buying it. And then they start buying and it starts moving back up and other people, what? They jump on the bandwagon. Okay. And then they start buying it. And then by the time you get to the tippy, tippy, tippy top, that's when all the novice people out there, all the scaredy pants out there, uh, all the people that are, aren't versed in how the market really works. That's when they get in right about ready for the next pullback. Okay. What Warren Buffett said, I can't remember the exact quote, basically do the opposite of everybody. You know, when that, you know, this, this staying in real estate, when there's blood in the streets, it's time to buy. Same with the stock market. When there's blood in the streets, it's time to buy. Do the opposite of what the average person does. You know, the average person out there doesn't even meet the S&P 500 returns. You could just go buy a Vanguard index fund for like 0.1% fees. And the average person doesn't even get that. Okay. So my point here simply is market trends have been coming and going for a long time. They're not going to stop. Okay. They're not going to stop. All right, so here is an example of the spiders, all right, on the monthly chart. Um, this is from earlier, the end of 2018, early 2019, okay? Notice, this is going back about 20 years, all right, give or take. We pulled back here, and why did we bounce here? I'm not really sure. There's no good reason to say we bounced here, but we did put in a little double bottom and a higher low, and we grinded higher. And then what happened? We got back up to this 150 to 160 level, which was the prior pivot high, which is in a resistance area. Remember, past price action to predict future price movement. Well, the last time we came up to the 160 mark, the SPY pulled back. The next time we came up to the 160 mark, oh, the SPY pulled back. Okay, where did we bounce? Roughly in the same area we bounced in 0203, roughly give or take $10. Okay. We stopped in the same area we did previously and we bounced in the same area we did previously. And then from then it's been a huge move higher. Okay. So you look at this and you go, wow, human beings really are very consistent creatures. Aren't we? The reason I'm, I continue to tell you this is this is how you're going to make money in trading by understanding human nature. That's all we're doing. We're not actually trading stocks. We're really just trading people, right? That's what we're really doing. Your opinion in the market versus my opinion in the market, okay? And there will always be differing opinions, right? You ever notice, I'll use a silly example. I love Skittles. I love this cherry strawberry, the red ones, and I love the purple ones. Green's my third favorite. The ones I hate are yellow and orange. I bet you the majority of people feel the same way, but the Skittles Corporation, okay, whatever company makes Skittles, they wouldn't put yellow and orange Skittles in the pack if nobody on the planet didn't like yellow and orange Skittles, right? Somebody out there likes yellow and orange Skittles. Otherwise, they wouldn't sell them. The point I'm making to tie this back into trading is there are people that are stupid, that are selling at the wrong time. Okay, now I'm not saying people that eat yellow and orange Skittles are stupid. Okay, they just have terrible taste. That's all. I'm kidding. But the point I'm making, guys, is that you and I look at this as a buying opportunity. We're looking at the market as overextended on the downside as a buying opportunity. And yet there are tons of people, literally millions of them, that are going, I need to get out of the market now. And you're sitting there going, whoa, wait a second. The market's just dropped 30% and you're saying you need to get out of the market now? No, 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 no. Now's the time you start buying the market and they're still getting out. That's why it goes lower. So yes, there are people out there who like yellow and orange Skittles, okay? That's why they're in the package. So the market goes higher, pulls back, goes higher, pulls back, goes higher, and then consolidates. Chops, chops, chops. Notice right in the consolidation, Bottoming tail, bounce. Where's the shakeout here? Right to the prior bottoming tail, okay? Right to the prior bottoming tail, okay? Look at all that. Wow, right? Wow. So what happens? Past price action predicts future price movement. We finally hold support, break out above this, 
Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'll be here all day explaining these things. All right, same thing here, guys. Here's a monthly chart of the Qs. Here's a great buy or a great breakout, by the way. It's sixty dollars, and you're going. Wait a second, that's a eleven dollar stop loss. It is right, but if you bought a thousand shares of the Qs back in two thousand twelve and you just held on to it, managed it out on pivots, maybe this tail gets you. Maybe that little shakeout gets you. All right, but look where you'd be at. I mean, my goodness. I mean, the Qs nowadays are, you know, in that 180 to 200 range. D do the math on that. It's a $120 move. If you bought 1,000 shares of that, you risked $11,000. You could have made over $100,000. You could have made over 10 to 1 on your money. Right? Okay. Wow. Crazy. And then you probably would have gotten shaken out here. You still would have made good money. Okay. Now, let's take a look at it again. We're gonna keep doing this till it sinks in, all right? We have a stock that's in an uptrend over here on the left, what little we can see. Huge wide range bar, another wide range bar. Doji bar, I would have honestly thought right here that bottoming tail suggests a likely bounce. It kept going lower and lower and lower. Bounces, pulls back, note. Where does it pull back to? Prior support at 55. Bounces right here, no, no, and no again. This is not a three bar play, why? because it's below resistance. Wide bar, narrow bar, it's below resistance. If this bar was up in like the 57 range, that's different. This is not, for those of you watching, not a three bar play that you would take because it's below resistance. All right, pulls back, moves up, pulls back, moves up, pulls back, and there we go again. Another test of this area, all right? And then finally, you start getting a little jiggy and the wide range bar breaks this. My point I'm making is, could you, could you buy this at 55.50 with a stop at 50? You could, but it would be very aggressive. Why? Because you have pivots above you to the left that suggest sellers are here. Yes, you have support. I agree, right? To the left, we have support, but you also have a pivot here and a pivot here that suggests there are sellers here. So it would be very aggressive to buy this. If you bought 55.50, you would take a very small position of this, okay? Then you would start getting serious about adding once you got above the 5675 area. But this is a full cycle, right? Stage two uptrend, stage four downtrend, stage one sideways trend, back to a stage two uptrend. The area you really wanna consider on this particular chart is right here at 5850. Right? You have a nice little pattern at 5850, stop 5750, try to trade it to 60. There's not a lot of money in it though, okay? Same deal here. Here's a W bottom transition. So over on the left, right? Over on the left, you have a, Stage two uptrend. Then we start dying and selling off into a stage four downtrend. Now notice something. Notice the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bars. Last one being wide range. We're gonna talk about volume here very shortly. Okay, we're gonna talk about volume very shortly. So that wide range bar came after six previous bars and it came on volume. That's usually the end of a move. And by the way, no, no, and no again. This is not a three-bar play right here. No, it's not a three. It's coming on the sixth or seventh bar down. So what happens is this looks like ending volume. And you chop around, chop around, chop around. You might think right here, this is a double bottom. You know what's a good thing to do, guys, just as a recommendation? When you're going through these charts, when you're looking at these charts, put a piece of paper over it. Hide it with a piece of paper so you can't see the future and then try to predict what will happen next. So right right where this line is, right right here, put a piece of paper on the all, everything on the right-hand side. Put a piece of paper and just look at the left and try to predict what the future will do. Go bar by bar. Move the paper very slowly, bar by bar by bar, and see if you can predict next. I would be looking at this as saying, hey, this might be a double bottom retest, okay? This might be a double bottom retest. Bounce, doesn't break this line though, and then fails again. Bounces again, and then pulls back. But where does it stop? Support. Now you have the trend line breaking over it right here. So I'm not gonna get into all the PTS concepts, guys. I don't have time for that. But when you break a trend line, that is your very first warning sign that perhaps the downtrend is broken. I'll repeat, when you break a trend line, that's your first warning sign that the downtrend has been broken. 
This is not, I repeat, this is not a buying opportunity. It's a warning sign, not a buying opportunity. It's a warning sign. The warning is telling you, watch for the next retest or the next consolidation because most likely this stock is going to go higher. It broke the, the trend. It's probably going to go higher. Okay. Then we retest the low here. Is this buyable? Aggressively buyable? Yes, but very aggressively buyable. Moves back up. Now, this is where it gets good. Sure, you could buy the double bottom, right? You have a double U bottom or a double bottom, whatever you want to call it. You broke the trend line, you're retesting, okay? So you retested the prior low and you failed to go lower. You retested the prior low and failed to go lower. That is bullish because it happened after a trend line break, right? So you move up, pull back, and then boom, this is the money. Wide range igniting bar breaks this pivot, this pivot, and this pivot. Oh my goodness gracious. This is, it's the nicest like bull flag you're ever going to see in your entire life. You have a stock that breaks the trend line, retest and failure, bounces back up, and the wide range igniting bar on igniting volume, we'll talk about it in a minute, broke the prior pivot here, broke the prior pivot here, and broke the prior pivot here and then gives you what looked like a three bar play. It started out as a three bar play, but then it turned into a flag wedge. You're gonna buy right here above the tiny little green bar. You're gonna buy it above the tiny green bar and you're gonna put your stop under this area here. You can put it under the green bar, it's too tight. Put it under here. So you're gonna get in this thing at like just over 46 bucks with a stop at like just, you're gonna look at like not even a dollar stop, not even, right? It's like 46.25 by like 45.25. So maybe a dollar, okay? The first bar, you're already up like two, three bucks. Moves higher, moves higher. Where's your first target? Right there, right there. That's your first, why? Because that's the prior pivot high, right? So your first target would be right here, drawing a line across it right there, okay? Prior pivot high at 50 bucks. Boom, that's sweet. That's four to one on your money. Pull back. What are you doing to pull back? You add, you buy more right here. You buy more, buy more, buy more, raise your stop to 47. Buy more at like 47.50. Your new cost average will be like 46.80 or something like that, give or take. And your new stop loss, 46.80. It's break even. It's a free trade. You already sold half, made some money. You added back, boom, another $5 move and you added back. This is money. Understanding how charts work is money, okay? All right. Wow, I'm taking a lot more time than I thought. I'm 40 minutes into this and I have not even gotten halfway through it. Um, all right, so here we go, guys. Big sell off. Now, note, note the bottoming tails right here. See the support? The stock should have probably held here. It was extended into support and it didn't hold. Hey, man, support breaks too sometimes. Okay, you got that wide range um, bar with a bottoming tail on volume. Bottoming tail right here. Okay, drop, 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 drop. Now, this stock, when you're taking a look at it over here, you're not sure. You're thinking doji bar, bottoming tail, volume, it should pop. It should pop. But it's too aggressive to buy. Now, if you wanted to buy this as a parabolic or a climactic, maybe we could talk about that. But it's still aggressive. So my point I'm getting at, guys, is you're not buying this first buy setup here. You're not taking this here. You're waiting. So it bounces back up, chops around, pulls back, puts in a higher low. Could you buy it here? You could. It's under the moving average. But this pullback is really sloppy, right? Topping tail here. It's very choppy. Bounces, pulls back, bounces, and then retests resistance and drops. This is the area you want to, want to look at. I want you to take note of something. Notice this pullback here, the overlappy slop. Topping tails, bottoming tails, bottoming tails, topping tails. Now look at this pullback. Look how much smoother this pullback is. This sequential pullback with lower highs and lower lows. Okay? That's what I want you to look at. Now I'm going to go to the next slide. We're going to break it down. Same slide, a little different. So now you're looking at a stock that is caught in what we call a range. It's, this stock has been range trading from like 75 to 95, right in that range but it's been very challenging to trade because it's been sloppy, all right? And this area was too aggressive. This area was too sloppy. So now you get this big time pullback, but it's not just any pullback. 
in the context of the chart, what is happening? One, it's going down to a prior pivot low, but it's not just a prior pivot low. It's seven bars down or six bars down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven bars down to a prior pivot low. Okay. Seven bars down to a prior pivot low, but they're not just any bars. They're not just narrow range bars. There's some that are wide range bars. So notice how we just keep chipping away at this, guys. We're not just saying seven bars down because they could be seven narrow range bars. We're not just saying any seven bars because they could be overlapping and sloppy bars. Where is it happening? At double bottom major support, level one support. So let's go down the list. These are your reversal signs. It's down seven bars, check. And they're big bars, right? Several bars are large. Check. Into multiple pivot support. Support here and some support here. Check. Increased volume at the bottom suggest ending. Check. Green bar at the bottom suggests buyers are coming into this. Bottoming tail. Buyers are coming into this. Do you see how we systematically broke this thing down? Number one, seven bars down. Number two, large bars. Number three, into a support area. Number four, increased ending volume. Number five, green bar at the bottom with a bottom. Now, six reasons that this stock should bounce. So this entry is the one you take. Now, some of you out there, particularly the newer traders, are going, well, over here, Jared, right in the middle, how do you know that this is going to happen? You don't. And it doesn't matter. If you're scanning and you see it, that's all that matters, right? You don't know if this is gonna happen, you know, five days, two weeks before it actually happens, right? If I knew that, then Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos would shine my shoes on a re regular basis and I'd have enough money to pay them to make it worth their time. You don't know. I can't predict two weeks into the future. I just know that this stock is something you might wanna put on a watch list as it tries to double bottom right here. Why? I might be looking to trade it over 95 at that point in time, but ultimately it ended up giving you a really sweet, sweet buy setup on 100% retracement, okay? The bottoming tail, the green bar, the doji bar, my goodness, you're gonna buy it right there, right around 80 bucks, it's a little bit above 80. Your stop's gonna be like, I don't know, two bucks maybe. And your first target will be a 50% retracement. First target will be a 50% retracement, right around 87. So you're looking at like three to one. And then your second target will be the high here, 94, 95 bucks. So you have about $15 in this thing. Sell half for a three R move, three to one move and sell the other half for like a seven to one move. Average out like five to one. That's pretty good. All right, it's pretty good. So again, bars are only important in the context of the chart. Past price action to help predict future price movements. And we do this in a systematic way that chips away. And the more things you have on your list, the more reliable the trade becomes. If you only had three of these six things, it's less reliable, but you have six things here. And technically you have a doji bar. You could add seven, right? It's a little doji bar. Add seven, seven things that suggest this stock is going higher. These things are taught by the way, in professional trading strategies. Okay. All right. This one I'm gonna skip for now, guys. All right, I'm just gonna flat skip it. Um, you know, this is just a gap down under a green bar. What this slide is showing is, hey, context of the chart, this stock is in a range, right? It's in a range from 1525 to 1950. We're gapping under two green bars. Stock looked like it was gonna go higher, it gaps down. You have room from $18 to 1525. This right here, this white space is called void. It's called tradable void. This is the room in which the stock could trade today from 18-ish down to 1525, right? Once you gap under that area, you're gonna see a little dot right there at the market open. You're gonna look for an entry into this thing, okay? But you have to know 1525 is your target area. You have to know that. This is a great gap, by the way. Gapping under two green bars and under a pivot, you could make an argument it's close to a level one gap and it's on volume. On volume, on volume, something we're gonna be talking about here soon. Okay, why am I putting this in here? Because it talks a little bit about what we just talked about. Okay, here's a daily chart because we always start with the daily chart. You're gapping over a red bar 
end over a pivot, right? Over a red bar and over a pivot. Our job, now that the daily looks good, right in the roughly $66 range, our job is to find some type of lower time frame pattern for entry, okay? All right, so we gap up, we're at 66. Uh, I missed this and you mentioned, but is seven bars of importance versus say six? No, seven's just an arbitrary number. The more bars it is, the more extended it is. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. All right, four bars, two bars could be too much. Remember, in the context of the chart, guys, you're missing the main principle I just talked about. In the con, guys, one bar could be too much if it's too big. So seven bars that are generally big is way too much. Six bars is way too much. Five bars could be too much. But then at the same time, you could be up three days and the stock not be extended because of the size of the bars. We got to add some common sense to our trading too, guys. When you see a bar that's like five times bigger than any other bar on the chart, that stock's probably a little bit tired, okay? All right, so what do we have here? You could buy the two-minute high. It's super aggressive, right? You could. You could buy the two-minute high. Borderline, all right? Stock moves up, pulls back. You have a buy setup right here, buyable. It retests, buyable, okay? So you almost have a little wedge here, so to speak. But what you have really is a buy setup here and a buy setup here to retest this. So on this particular day, I like this very early. I was very aggressive because of the pre-market chart. Unmall was less aggressive and took the second entry. See what we're getting at? So I took the aggressive entry because of the pre-market chart. Unmall took the less aggressive entry because of the retest, the double bottom retest there. See it right around 10 o'clock. He calls it right at 9.57. So there are two plays here. This is all possible because of the daily chart. Without the daily gap, this is not possible, okay? Same situation here, retest, all right? You see that double bottom? I'm showing this to you because they don't just have to be on stage four downtrends that retest into a stage one. You can have a gap up that pulls back, bounces, and retests. That's a viable buy setup. Moves higher, pulls back, moves higher, okay? Moving on, guys. I have a lot of slides to get through still. Okay. What do we have here? Higher time frame breaking down to the lower time frame. Right. So the higher time frame gives us our bias. What does this mean? Basically, guys, over the 154 area, this stock is breaking out. What is this? This is an ascending triangle. Right. You have a flat top with higher lows on a 60 minute. So when you look at the dotted red line to the dotted red line, all this white space is called void. So from 154 to like, I don't know, 167, all of that, $13 is tradable void. So once I see this, I'm going, wow, I need to find an entry. But what made this so good? The nasty pullback. It dropped from 167 down to 140. Super wide range bars, right? One, two, three, four, five bars, huge volume. Little wedge here that actually gapped up and then failed. Finally, it sets a flat top in. But what makes it so great is how extended this move was and then the consolidation. It rested for one, two, three, four, five days. Our goal, find an entry. What do we get? We got a little one minute breakout. That's it, right at 154, a little one minute breakout. 154, stop. Low of the day because it's so early in the day. It moves up, pulls back. You got a little three bar play right here even. Wide bar, narrow bar, rip. See the ad? So you get the original entry at 154. Then you get the ad at 154.45. You raise your stop. Pulls back, add again. Okay. I called this 154 by 153.40. All right. And it was on the favorites list that day. All right. Over 155. I wanted to be extra cautious, but the pattern was just so good at 154. We took it. Okay, same thing here, guys. All right, now, this one's a little different. We have the beautiful daily chart, right? We gap above this pivot and we need to kind of break that like 245, 250 range. Why? We have a stock that sold off huge from 280 down to 230. It bounced and just consolidated. It looked like a stage one that might move into a stage two, right? So you have a stage two uptrend by a stage four downtrend by a stage one sideways trend. Gap up is the early stage two. You're sitting here going, hmm, you know what the problem is, guys? Is there was no entry right off the open. 
right? This stock literally, see that 930? See that little bar, the double arrows here, top and bottom? Wide range bar. Now, some of you go, oh, three bar play. It's an eight or nine dollar bar. There's no way you could realistically take that. I understand in hindsight, repeat, in hindsight, I understand this thing popped like 10 more dollars. But after it goes eight dollars in the first five minutes of the day, it's really hard to take that three bar play. It would have held and it would have worked, but it was really aggressive. Okay, so what do we do? We nibble some right at the market open. Why? We have a 15 minute bicep. This is using a pre-market chart. Now take a look. 9.27 in the morning, 9.18 in the morning. This is 12 minutes for the market. I like Ulta over 2.47. 9.27, Ulta over 2.46 to 2.47 area. Okay. I expect Ulta to be insanely spready and whippy. Expect a 50 to 75 cent spread on Ulta. Guys, I try to keep you guys abreast of what's happening. All right. So I mentioned these 10 minutes before they happen. In this case, one or two minutes before it happens. I even put it out there in stock twits. We nibbled some right there and boom, pops right at the open. Okay. The people that logged out, you're missing out, man. This is the best part. I thought that was good. This is the best part. Okay. So we just talked a lot about context, right? It's not just what is happening. It's where it is happening. Right, A wide range bar is nice. A bottoming tail, a topping tail, a doji bar. All those things are great. But where they happen on a chart is far more important. But what makes that even more important? Right, We're going next level now. I hope you guys are seeing here right, that when we trade, we're looking to go to the basic core of something. right? Strip it down to the bare metal. And then we're going to take that and we're going to form a trade out of it. And the more, not just patterns, but the more confirmation that we get, okay, the better and more reliable your trades will be. Volume is one of the confirmations you're looking for. Now, guys, I'm going to be honest with you. What you're seeing today is about three pages, four pages out of PTS. It's 525. It's like three or four pages. So volume is only one of the criteria we use, okay, when we talk about essential patterns and pattern boosters and all that stuff. This is one of the pattern boosters, okay? Volume to me is extremely important, okay? Price tells us what is happening. Volume tells us how it is happening, okay? So remember, there are three kinds of volume to help us discern when a stock might change direction or continue a move. Keep in mind, we are not only looking at volume, we're also looking at support resistance levels, how the stock arrived at its current location, as well as the volume associated with the move. Lastly, on certain types of move, particularly climactic reversals, it is common to have both types of volume happening in succession. So we have three types, igniting, ending, and resting. Igniting ignites a move in a new, new, new direction or continues an already strong non-extend this is key so igniting means it's a new direction or it's a continuation of a current direction except the continuation of the current direction is a non-extended move typically a lengthy consolidation right typically a lengthy consolidation ending is simple it ends the current extended move that's key the current extended move and resting volume guys allows a stock to rest enough to continue its current move after a pause typically seen in consolidations or breakouts, okay? You will often see igniting and ending volume back to back on climactics, okay? You will often see resting volume with igniting volume on breakouts. Let's take a look, okay? So what we have here, guys, is igniting and ending, right? So notice we have two, four, six red bars, two, four, six, two, four, six, seven green bars, okay? Right here, if, notice there's no volume here, if increased volume happens here, it's likely igniting volume, right? That's the first bar of this move. That would be igniting volume if it happened, okay? If you have the same exact volume here, it's not the same meaning. Let me explain. This, if you had an increase in volume right here, that would be considered igniting a move lower. But after six bars down, 
the same exact volume on this bar would not be represented in the same way, right? The meaning has changed. This volume equals an igniting volume, a new move lower. This would be ending volume. Why? Because it's six bars down on a wide range bar with volume. This likely means the stock will probably be bouncing soon. Now, the same thing on the long side. If you got a huge volume spike right here, that would be considered igniting volume, right? But if you got the exact same volume spike up here, that would be considered ending volume. Why? Because of where it's happening on the chart. Okay, let's take a look. Pro and novice volume, ending, igniting. Okay, basically is what we're talking about. Pro is igniting volume, novice is ending volume. Okay, so you'll take note, this stock dropped, retested, bounced, consolidated, and finally broke this area. Okay, pseudo three bar play. It was down a few bars, then you had a wide bar, narrow bar, and it dropped. All right, so here is an extended move lower with much higher than normal volume and multiple large bars. Once the acceleration in price and volume happens, you know the bottom is near, it's ending volume. So what we have here, guys, at the beginning of this, this is gonna be igniting. Why? Because it's a new move below support. It's not some crazy extended move. It's a little bit extended, but you do have a green bar bottom. So this right here, this big volume spike, that's igniting volume, okay? It's going lower, it's going lower, it's going lower. And then as you get to the bottom, what happens? The bars are getting bigger and the volume is getting bigger. This is ending volume. What is this? These are the last bastion of people that want to get out of the stock. They're exiting the stock now. These are the people that can't take it anymore, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Some people, you know, you say, oh, they're making money, but those aren't the people selling. Those people are covering, right? So right here, you have some people going, all right, you know, maybe the stock will bounce. It's not that bad. Maybe the stock won't. These are the people that held on as long as they could. These are the white knuckle people, right? They go, I just can't take it anymore, right? When the pain becomes too great, they finally throw up the, wet, the white flag and say, I'm out. That is when you know what's happening. Why? Because you're already down two, four, six, eight, nine bars in a row, and the volume continues to increase. This is ending volume, followed by igniting volume, right? Wide range green bar in a new direction. Okay, you have a little mini three bar play off the bottom and look at the huge volume spike. Okay, so you can see back to back here on a climactic type of a move, you have the ending volume right here and two bars later, the igniting volume. But once you get down this much, six, seven, eight bars, and the volume is this big, you know the end is near. All the people that wanted to get out finally got out. You know that because of the volume spike, okay? Now, here's an example of a parabolic, all right? So you have a stock that's just kind of him hauling around, right? So you're in kind of a, a stage one consolidation, stage two uptrend, a micro V top stage three, and then ba boom right? Super wide range bar followed by a super wide. Now take a look at this volume. Look at this volume compared to the volume to the left. Look to the left. Now look at this. Guys, this stock was doing like 30,000 shares on a bar. And then magically on a five minute chart, you're all of a sudden you're starting to do five, 600,000 shares in volume. 30,000 shares versus six, 20 times normal volume. I'll repeat that. 20 times normal volume. Guys, the end is near. This ignited the move, and then you get another bar with the same volume, and then you start getting bottoming tails. This is all ending volume right here, okay? Then you get a little bit of igniting volume, and then right here, you get more ending volume. Massive volume after a huge move up is ending volume, okay? Massive volume after a huge move up is ending volume. Massive volume after a huge move down is ending volume. Okay? Let's take a look at it contextually. Okay? So we have the three types, ending, igniting, and resting. So what do we have here? Beautiful consolidation back towards the rising moving average. Very narrow range, very tight range. Entries 42 bucks, stops like 4180. It's awesome. You know what's awesome about it? The volume is quiet. 
stock is just taking a breather. It's resting. Okay, it's getting ready to go for a nice run, maybe a sprint perhaps, and right now it's just resting. Why is this important? It's important for two reasons. One, because the stock has already moved up a lot. All right, it's already moved up a lot. So it has to rest. And how long it rests is important. In this case, it moved back to the moving average. So it rested for like two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 bars in a row. Okay, I like the flat top, but I really like how there's not huge volume. It also tells me there's no big tug of war going on in here. It's just mainly buyers today. You can see that it's mainly buyers. If you weren't sure if it was mainly buyers, take a look at this engulfing bar right here, right? Red bar sellers tried to come in and the buyer said, no, 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 no. We're in control today. The buyers are in control, pushes it right back up. But you wouldn't buy it at 42 over here because it's too extended, right? It needs to, it needs to rest. So it chops and then starts to consolidate in a very nice tight manner with low volume. And this is what you want to see. When it breaks 42, when it breaks 42, huge igniting volume. What does this tell me? Commitment. The buyers are in control. Increased volume with priced movement equals commitment. Okay. If you have price movement without volume, that could be a lack of commitment. Because remember, guys, this type of volume on a stock, 100,000, 200,000 shares, this is institutional commitment. This isn't your mom and pops, okay, buying this thing. And then you get a little bit more of that igniting volume. And then what happens is you get really up, really extended right there. What do you get? Massive volume pop. That's an ending volume, guys. That's it. This move is finished. It's over. It's done. Get out. All right. Either get out there or tighten your stop and walk away. Same deal here. Notice the breakout. Consolidation. All right. Red bar comes in, pops back up. Another consolidation. Notice resting volume. Very quiet volume. Okay. Very, very quiet volume. Once it breaks out, boom. Igniting volume. Right. Igniting volume. Okay. Guys, stocks can move. The question is, how is it possible to have big price action without low volume? People willing to pay, right? I mean, how can a pair of jeans go from $10 to $100? Well, one person comes in and says, I'll pay $100 for it. So you could have a stock that moves up a dollar on 200 shares. You could have a stock move up a dollar on one share. It's all a matter of if people are willing to pay for it. It happens all the time. Stocks move up on low volume. You don't want that because if they move up on low volume, one, you might be the person moving it and you never want that, okay? Two, it's likely going to be very spready and you don't want that. And three, and most important, you're not an institution. You want to follow the institutions. You don't want to be the institution, all right? I mean, you do, but not in our case because you don't have that kind of buying power, right? So... A stock could move up on a couple shares. You know, if, if you say, hey, Jared, the price is 76.10, I say, okay. And the next guy says, I got 100 shares. You know, I'm willing to pay 76.80 for it. Okay. You just moved up 70 cents on 100 shares. Okay. Um, so anyway, right here, this is consolidating. Look at the volume. It's resting. You're taking a breather. Why? You sprint it in the morning. You need a little break before you go for your afternoon workout. And that's what the consolidation is back towards the removing average, breaks out above this area, big time volume. That's 200 plus thousand shares. Guys, the stock normally does like 10,000 shares. Now it's doing 200. That is institutional commitment. That's exactly what you want to see. Okay. Thank you, Vibe Doc. Uh, for those of you that think this is a great lecture, because a couple of you, you commented, this is like whipped cream to shit compared to what PTS is. Okay. We've gone over like four slides out of the book compared to 525. Anyway, so you can see the different types of volume, but it's again, I want to repeat this. So I hope it sinks in. It's not just what is happening. It's where it's happening in the context of the chart. Guys, you can have massive volume in the middle of no man's land, right? You can have massive volume in the middle of no man. It doesn't mean anything to us, but when you get big volume right here, it's super meaningful. It means institutions have your back. 200,000 shares, that means somebody out there that's big, a big boy wants this. You want to just ride their coattails, okay? You're never going to get in front of them. You want to ride their coattails, okay? Same deal here, guys, all right? Same deal here. 
This one earlier, why am I showing you this guys? I'm showing you this because this is pre-market. Now, some of you want to know why I focus so darn much on the pre-market, okay? If you didn't have, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Hold on one second here. Let me uh, just pull up a Word document. Hold on. I'm going to pull up a blank document. All right? Okay, let's do this. Okay. Right there. That right there is the market open, I, th I believe. Okay? Okay. I, I'm doing this on purpose. I'm covering this. Why? Because that's all you see when the market opens. That's it. That's all you see when the market opens. You don't know what happened before. We why? Because you're not looking at the pre-market. You're too good for that. Because you don't need it. All that other good stuff, right? That's that's what happens when the market opens. Now I'm going to take it off the screen. And you're going to get a little different look, aren't you? Oh my goodness! This stock dropped from 175 to 150 in what? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 45 minutes. This, ladies and gentlemen, is like 8:30 in the morning. 8.30. This is long before the market opens. Drops, chops around, and then as soon as the market opens, look at the massive volume that comes in and the stock just ripped higher. You don't think it's much? It's like a $9 move. We bought this thing not right off the open, but close. Why? Because it was a climactic buy setup. It was a parabolic buy setup. Okay? If it gets there, add over the high there on STZ and raise the stop. We had a wide stop too. Three bucks. You would have never thought to buy this stock if you hadn't seen this move. And if you hadn't seen this level of pre-market volume. I know some of you are going, geez, Jared, that's not a lot of volume. No, it is. For the pre-market, it is. When the market opens, of course you're going to do more volume. But in the pre-market, this is massive amounts of volume in the pre-market. Okay? Massive amounts of volume in the pre-market. Okay? So remember, guys, everything we do is in the context of the chart. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And I want you to just take note, we didn't go through all of it, but how we systematically broke down these charts. We looked at, oh, four bars down, bottoming tail. That bottoming tail is far more meaningful after four bars down than it is after five bars up, okay? And what slide was that? Let's see if I can find it, it was this one. This is where we really broke it down systematically. Seven bars down. Several bars are wide range bars. Into support. Huge increase ending volume. Green bar at the bottom. Bottoming tail. Doji bar. We systematically took this thing from a bare bones piece of metal and we formed it into art. And that's what you have to do. Okay? And I am telling you flat. Volume will be one of the most important indicators that you use, okay? Because it tells you about the commitment or lack there of commitment from the large institutions. You never want to see a stock break on low volume. And you never want to see a stock break on high volume that doesn't break much. If you see a stock break by three pennies on high volume, a shakeout is about to happen. If you see a stock break on volume with good price movement, like we just saw a slide ago, you're good. You're golden. So you guys want to know when a stock breaks and I go, oh man, that's a terrible break. That's what I mean. That's what I'm reading when I make those comments. Okay. That's what I mean. Um, let me go back. Somebody's asking, why is the target 160? Um, the target is typically a 50% retracement or a move back to the declining moving average. Zimco, that's right out of PTS. Have you not taken PTS Zimco? That's right out of the textbook that you're looking at. 50% retracement or a move back to the declining moving average is our target on climactics. Okay. Um, so anyway, guys, I hope that you guys enjoyed that lecture. It went a little longer than I had anticipated. Um, but I think it's valuable information and I keep reiterating this. If you guys think that's good information, we just, we just did like four or five slides. Okay. So there's a lot you need to understand to be a successful trader. Okay. There's a lot you need to understand. And I think a lot of people don't realize, they look at something like a three bar play and go, oh, it's so simple, I'm gonna be a millionaire overnight. No, you have to understand price action. If you don't understand price action, you're in big, big, big trouble, right? So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that lecture, okay? To get more great educational content, subscribe to the Live Traders YouTube channel. This way you'll get email alerts every time I upload a new video.